Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted with Susan Smith. Hello, YouTube friends, and welcome to my studio. I'm Susan Smith, and I'm going to be stitching at the long arm today. I call these episodes live and unscripted because they're aired in real time, kind of from start to finish of a project with me talking through the decisions and choices and even challenges as I go. So that's kind of what you can expect. Today I'm working on a whole cloth quilt. And if you haven't heard that term before, it just means that there's no actual piecing involved. There's just one solid piece of fabric on the top. And in this case, I've chosen a fairly um, solid color as well. And then the batting, of course, and then the backing. And I've got this really pretty Tula Pink backing, which I'll, I'll tell you what it is in a few minutes so that if you want to do the same thing, you can do that as well. So it's a very simple premise. I've got a yard and a half for the back of the quilt, and I've got a yard and a quarter for the top. And I've trimmed my top just a little narrower so that I have some gripping room on the backing to work with. And I'm just going to quilt pretty designs on that top. Today we're going to focus on border type designs. So it will have a kind of striped effect when it is all said and done. So this is a really fun way, a small whole cloth like this, to explore some quilting ideas that you've wanted to try on a small scale and not do something enormous with. So in the past I've done some whole cloths that had a bit of ruler work. I did, I think I did two that had kind of chevron shaped uh, ruler work first and then laid some pretty designs in that. So it's a fun way to play with something new that you've been wanting to try at your long arm with sort of a low commitment level. And it ends up making a very lovely baby quilt really. So on the top, which is more solid, you see all the pretty quilting. And on the back, you've got some sort of gorgeous print. And I do all kinds of different things on the back. And I usually start my choices with the backing. And then I pick something on the top that coordinates with it. So that's what we're working on today. Before I do go a ton further, um, I wanted to talk to you about one little thing. We often offer, um, when we're talking about this show, because YouTube is free, we offer a way, if you wish, to support the show. And it is at a simple place called buymeacoffee.com. And of course, Dave's going to be back in a minute. He had to run out for something. So he'll put that on the screen for you. But let me tell you specifically what we're doing right now. We actually hired a consultant who's a cinematographer also a friend. And he has come in and given us some really big ideas for lighting and camera work that hopefully are going to make a more enjoyable show and a clearer view for you. You know, lighting, I've talked about it in other shows. It's always a bit of a struggle. On a sunny morning, it's lovely. On other types of days, it's sometimes hit and miss, whether we can get good lighting and whether, you know, my face looks red or shadowed or whatever. So he's helping us out with that. So all that to say, buymeacoffee.com, we set that up purely as a way to um, give you an opportunity if you wish to contribute and every dollar that comes in through that goes toward upgrading our equipment. So this is kind of our next goal now is this upgrading of lighting and I won't go into a ton of details on it but it runs into a number of zeros let's just say and so it's a bit of a production so that's what we're going to be working toward next so i'll keep you posted as we progress on that over the next few episodes and as we get that all set up and of course you'll see it in the result of the show so that's one fun project so again it's at buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by susan as little as five dollars for a single donation or if you wish you can sign up for a monthly commitment also, thanks are due in a couple of places. One is our son, Will, who does the fun little intros in the various voices that you always hear at the beginning of the show. I think this morning was, was it the French general, Mr. Producer? I think so. Anyway, so thanks to Will for doing those fun voices. It makes kind of a playful introduction and always makes me smile to hear his voice when the show's beginning. Um, our very good friend, Dan Unger, is who provides the guitar music that you will hear throughout as I'm quilting. And we appreciate that so much. He just generously lets us use it. And then, of course, my husband is Mr. Producer Dave. He's behind the scenes, cables and wires and monitors galore, um, keeping this whole thing afloat because it is definitely not a one-woman show. So great big thanks to all those people. Okay, are we ready to get started quilting? I think so, and I'll talk more about other places you can find me and podcast and things like that as we go along. If you do enjoy this show, please do consider liking and subscribing. So the thumbs up, the subscribe, that helps me get in front of more quilters' eyes. So let's talk about fabric. This is the backing we're going to be using and I'm going to turn it. Let's see if I can get the animals right side up. They go both ways. doesn't matter. You're going to see it this way. 
So this is a Tula pink fabric. And it's got, as you can see, the kind of rainbow colors. It's a little bit polka dot and it's got these lovely um, sort of subtle uh, printed animals in it. So this was my inspiration, my jumping off point, if you will, this lovely rainbow color. And then I went hunting for a solid or something that read solid to go with it. And you'll see it in a moment. It's kind of a mottled sort of coral color because I love corals. So let's go ahead and load up our backing. And if you're new to the channel, I'm going to show you a really speedy way to load backing onto the quilting frame. And before I do that, I'll actually pull Stella over just a little. This is... Okay, Mr. Producer's got to fix something over there. I'll let him do that and I'll show you the machine in a moment. Let's get ready to load the backing. We don't want to waste too much time talking. So when I load my backings, I do not take the trouble or the time to center my leaders or my backing or my quilt top. Massive time saver. And I'll show you how that works and why that works as we go along. So all that I need is a straight edge on the edge that is facing me, which depending on the type of the quilt, I often can wrangle it such that the selvage edge is facing me and then it's perfectly straight. But for today's purposes, I'm loading my quilt straight on because I want to create those stripes going from side to side. Sometimes I do load my quilts sideways. It's a little more efficient for quilting, fewer passes down the quilt. But in this case, my quilting is directional. So that determines that I want to load the quilt this way. So let's get some red snappers in our hands. So I'm using the red snapper system, which means that I've got a little red, this same material. There's a little red rod that goes through the hem of my leader. And this is an open channel, which I will snap over it. I love these things. So I just start loading really anywhere. I'm just influenced by kind of where I want my quilt to be on the frame. And I'm more or less in the center, whatever's convenient in my case for the cameras. And I just start snapping that straight edge on. And I use my leader to guide me to keep it straight. I'm very careful to not stretch out that cut edge of fabric. And I kind of anchor it here with my left hand, straighten it a little if I need to, and then snap, snap, snap that leader in place. Super quick, as you can see. And then I have smaller increments, which I will tuck on the end. Doesn't matter if it extends beyond the quilt. And I've got my clamps at the moment. I had my clamps on both ends of this leader just to hold it in place so it's not always flopping out of my way. And from here, now I am spreading my quilt backing over the back rail. And it's important that I get it straight. I don't want it to be veering to one side or veering to the other. This is how I can avoid having to line up center points is by being conscious of the grain of my fabric and getting it straight. So I'm using this straight front edge and then I'm just going to pull this fabric on. And one more super trick, if you have not seen me loading before, and that is this. You can see that my backing is a little wrinkled. It came straight off the fold that I bought it from the store. I just unfolded it and started loading. And I've got a water bottle. Ah, let me get organized here in front of the cameras. And I'm just going to spritz, gently spritz the whole thing. And that is going to cause all those creases to relax and enable me to not have to press my quilt backing. Trust me, this works. It's absolutely genius. And where the center fold is, that's quite a distinct fold. So I'm just going to make sure that's got a little moisture. And presto. In a few seconds time, that causes all those wrinkles to relax and we're good to go. So now I'm going to roll it on. And I'm watching underneath to see when it approaches the edge of my back leader. And then I'll walk around to the back and attach my red snappers on that end. So when you have larger quilt backs, you sometimes have to walk around a couple times and smooth it out because you want to be sure there are no wrinkles and that it's feeding on very straight. With a quilt this small, that was pretty easy to do. I keep an extra magnet 
you'll see how I use the magnets in a few moments. I keep an extra one on this side of my machine just so that I can hold it almost like a pin right there so my fabric doesn't inadvertently fall off while I'm trying to get my leaders attached. So it's just like a little extra hand, a third hand. And again, I'm just snapping my red snapper on to the frame. So those of you who do watch regularly know that I've been messing around with whether or not to use the red snappers, etc. And I've been using them the last couple of days with good success. I've got, this will make sense to those of you who use red snappers at all, that little rod that's running in the hemline, I moved it in from the edge of my leader. So all I've got to do to feed my leader through the machine under the needle is to move beyond that hem. Now, the million dollar question is gonna be when I try to do this with the camera attached. Let's see if I have enough room. Mr. Producer is standing on the other side grinning at me because we kind of think I'm not going to. In which case, I might have to take those snappers off and pin. I would hate to spend that time, but it might come to that. It's right down here. Hang on. Hang on, Dave. I can do it because I'm past my... I'm pa so, sorry, you guys. You're hearing us converse um, in the background, and I apologize for that. Let me just get this organized. I don't want to spend too, too much time on the loading because I really want to get to the quilting today. So I'm just using my knowledge of the snappers and where I can pass that red snapper through under my needle. And it's going to work just off of my quilt. It's thicker where I've put the clamp on. And so if I go beyond the clamp, it's thin enough that I can slip that through under the needle. Okay. Here's Stella, by the way, and I'm just going to turn her headlight off because I think that films better. There we go. This is Stella. Stella is Bernina Q24, and I do have the Qmatic or the digital system, but I'm not using it today. Everything we do today is going to be freehand or with the channel locks. So we've got her all loaded and ready to go. But this is my completed backing loaded, and you can see how very, very few minutes that actually took. It's a small quilt and even with me talking all the way through it, like it just takes a couple of minutes. It's evenly loaded. There's no sag or tension. It's just beautifully smooth and straight. Just that simple. Okay, batting is next. And today I'm using my current favorite, which is Hobbs 8020. I think they call it their heirloom line. Um, so it's 80% cotton, 20% poly. It's a very great all-purpose batting. It's got a great price tag, great price point on it. It's very washable. It does not remember creases when you fold a quilt. It has a little more loft than all cotton battings. Lots of reasons why I love it. So that's what we've got for our batting. And here comes our pretty coral top. So I did say, it's just kind of this mottled, so it will still show up the quilting, but has a little more interest than a complete solid. But I've done complete solids too. Whatever your taste runs to. And I have trimmed this piece of fabric. So my selvage, um, this was my fold line. My selvages were on the right and left side. But I did trim a little off each side so that my backing is a bit larger. It's very difficult to quilt with them the same size because you have nothing to grip then on the sides. Batting keeps wanting to pull up under there. And I did press this. I confess that. It had such a distinct fold line in the middle, and I wanted to be able to, um, I wanted it to show well on camera and not have that great crease in it. So I did press this. So that's our little quilt top. So my next step, and I do this on absolutely every, every quilt, is to baste. I need to make my whole quilting area be secure and not move. So this is how I do it. I baste up the left side, across the top, and down the right side. And different quilters do this in a different order. Some start, you know, in the middle of the top and work left, and then in the middle and work right. There's not really a right or wrong to that. There's what works for you. But I've done this enough times that I'm comfortable managing my fabric 
just going all three sides in quick succession and not having to stop and start. When I have a larger quilt, I will often put my channel locks on so that I'm positive I have a straight line up each side. I didn't bother today on such a little quilt, but I am going to put the channel lock on for the top. So all that I'm doing on my machine is engaging my belt in this one direction. So it holds my machine. I can't move it forward or back. So I'm going to get a really lovely straight line across the top. And I love that straight line. Helps me keep a very square quilt. And honestly, there are times when I shortcut that too and eyeball a straight line based on my leader. But today, channel lock it is. So I'm just using the fingers of my left hand to be sure that the fabric is not pushing out in front of my hopper foot. I want it to be getting under the needle. Of course, it's a nice flat piece of fabric. There's no seams to deal with, so it's pretty straightforward. And I need to take that channel lock off. I do have to trot around on my machine to disengage the belt. I keep saying channel lock, which is really not the right term. I'm really engaging and disengaging the belt. And I've got a quarter inch basting stitch on. That's entirely personal preference. You could do a larger basting stitch. You can even do it in your regular quilting stitch and it doesn't matter. This just secures that outer perimeter of the quilt. I think it's absolutely essential. Um, if, you, if you quilt the interior of it without doing that securing, it will pull in. There's no getting around it. So I always secure my quilts. So that's one, two, three sides secured. And number four is these magnets, which are just garage tool type magnets, inexpensive from a local hardware store. And they go right on the front, securing this fourth side. So now I've got a working area that cannot shift or pull in really, really nice and smooth. Mr. Producer is going to adjust this camera on the machine. So I'll put the side clamps on and he'll maybe put some nice music on and it's going to take him a minute or two to do that. And we'll be right back and start quilting. Okay, much better. So now we've got a better view, I think. So a couple weeks ago, I released a little, a short video about these side clamps, which are part of the Red Snapper system. And today's project is a really good example of a piece of fabric that can be tricky. You're loading the fabric into a very, very thin little channel in there. And this fabric has that selvage edge that's got a bit of fringe, about an eighth inch of fringe. So it can be tricky to load these clamps. I just use a croissant. Now which camera am I on? 
sorry about that. We did not realize I was still muted. Okay. What I've got here is a couple little quilts that I've done in the past strictly for exploration and play. And it's kind of what inspired the idea of just quilting all these little borders, kind of a mashup of borders to explore borders, to try out different borders, etc. So this little one, the quilting's not going to show up super well for you, but you can see all the green stripes that are in the background of the apple on one side and half of the apple on the other side. I did something different in every one of those stripes and they're fine. So it was good practice to do a little teeny tiny slim borders. So that's one, we'll toss that off camera. This one you'll see a little better. I'll show you the owls first because they're so dang cute. My niece drew me those owls. And so this is on a solid gray background and all of my quilting on here was simply an exploration of different borders, just thinking of as many different border type designs as I could. So that's what we're gonna do today on this coral one. We're gonna do some larger, some smaller, just a mashup of border ideas. So if you wanna do this project for yourself, be collecting some border ideas. Pinterest is a great place to look. Um, just doodling, watching people's photographs on Instagram and social media, that's a great way to find some border ideas. I'm going to put my yardsticks on the edge because I don't have a ton of spare space beyond the edge of my quilt and I can feel the nose of my long arm um, touching up against the, the clip, the side clamp. So putting these yardsticks in here just elevates them a little bit and enables me to quilt right to the edge pretty smoothly. Um, let us, I'll move Stella out of the way. Let's take a few questions before I actually dive into quilting and let me grab my lukewarm coffee. And I'll stand back from the quilt, I promise. Okay. Whew, it's a warm one today. Connie Bailey, is that issue only with your new Bernina? And this, you're talking about the red snapper going under. It's going under the dead bar that's kind of the issue. So the dead bar relative to the arm of my machine. Bernina has a recommended setting for that distance and it's pretty slim. So I'm experimenting with that. And I was at Bernina University last week and talking with a bunch of other quilters and seeing what their experiences have been. So I'm going to try out some different things. But for today's purposes, I'm just getting off the big uh, snapper clip in order to get around it. Okay, three-part question coming up. I'm ready. Star, hey Susan, just signing on. I have a Stella too. That's awesome. Come for a visit and we can play with Cumatic. That sounds like fun. And you're in Huntsville, Ontario. Awesome. So I said earlier I'm an Ontario girl and I've said a few times I'm a BC girl. So I was born in Ontario, raised in British Columbia. So for you Canadians, you'll, you'll see how I've kind of covered the country. <laughs> Morning coffee is so good. I'm telling you. I should mention to put a cue in front of your questions if you think of it. It makes it easier for us to search and find them. How does Hobbs 8020 compare to Fairfield 8020 from the big box stores? Been quilting for two years and would like to buy a roll. I'm not familiar with the Fairfield, I'm sorry to say. So I can't really make a comparison for you. I just know I've found Hobbs to be very good, durable quality at a really good price point. That's my experience. Susan Young, when moving back to the bottom, did you have to make a custom leader? Oh, I see what you're saying. No, Susan, and I and I wondered who would ask that question. All I did was, Bernina recommends rolling your backing on this bar that's right in front of me. You can't see it on the camera right now. So your backing, Mr. Producer's gonna change cameras. So your backing, the top end is facing you, the bottom end is usually right here, and the lower bar is where your quilt top is rolled onto. All I did was change that order. I have nothing on this belly bar in front of me, and I roll the bottom end of my backing on that lower bar so that I only have my single quilt layer going over this belly bar so that my magnets will hold. That's just my personal modification to use my efficient loading system and I always float my tops so I don't need that roller for my top. Hope that answers your question. Cheryl, does the dampness from the water ever interfere with stitching? It never has, Cheryl. It's, it's pretty little, honestly. Um, when I have the time, I might spray it and walk away for even 15 or 20 minutes and it will dry. I don't usually take the time. I usually quilt it same day and I've never had a problem with it. Knock on wood. 
Sue, what is the distance between your dead bar and the sewing plate? The Bernina recommended amount or a bit more. Right now, it is the Bernina recommended amount, which is six millimeters. Um, I'm going to try it a little bit more. I am. If you're a Bernina sewer, you'll know some of the differences that can make. I'm going to play with that a little bit. Terry, question. Thanks for the cue. Do you draw lines for the border areas or just wing it? I personally just wing it. You absolutely could draw lines. You could pin it in place. You could use a ruler any way that works for you to get that outer perimeter basted in place. Susie, about how many hours a day do you quilt and how often do you take breaks? I find the back neck starts to hurt after an hour of quilting. Thanks. I don't quilt as many hours a day as I used to because I do many other things now besides quilting, teaching, traveling, etc. But when I am quilting, I try to take a break, I would say at a minimum, once an hour, maybe even once every half hour, like at least moving around doing something else. And of course, you do take breaks to advance the quilt, right? And you can do a neck roll or an arm swing or whatever. But I do try and actually take a several minute break at least once an hour. And I don't ever quilt. I don't ever quilt more than eight hours in a day. I know there are quilters who do, but I don't because it is tiring. Marilyn, my red snappers are so tight, I can't use them. Any suggestions? You know, they do ease up with using Marilyn. You might try, if you have a tub, you might try soaking them in hot water or even running a blow dryer over them just to soften that plastic. That can be helpful. And that's it for questions. Okay, you guys, we got to get quilting. So something, shall I show you? Yes, I'm going to pull my gray quilt up again. Something that I did on here that I think is important. We're on the side camera, yeah? Can you see this? I have actually got straight lines quilted between the borders. To me, that feels critical. For one thing, how else are you going to keep all those borders straight, right? And secondly, it adds um, a, a place for the eye to rest. It adds a pause. It adds, you know, between each border, keeping them distinct. Otherwise, I feel like it would look super muddy. So because I do have the belt that I can engage and disengage easily, some of you might have mechanical channel locks. Um, that to me is relatively easy to lay down some straight lines. So that's actually what I'm going to do first. And this is pretty random. I'm just going to lay in some straight lines that go across the quilt. So it's going to go one more level in stabilizing all of this. And it's going to give me lines to quilt between, making my borders super, super easy. If you were quilting a border, you know, you would have a, a, an edge to it and it would be the piecing line. Well, I don't have that here, but I'm going to create it with quilting. And in most cases, I'm going to do a double or a triple line. Somehow, I think the double line looks more polished and finished in separating designs than a single line does too. So the only planning that I've done is I have a couple designs in mind that are that are larger, that are maybe six inches from top to bottom. And I kind of want to get those, um, I think I'm going to do four of them. So I want to kind of space them out over the quilt. So I'm going to think about putting in some big ones. Between that, it's going to be entirely random. Medium, small, whatever takes my fancy. Let's see if I can reach my channel lock from here. I can if I take my yardstick off. We might employ Mr. Producer to stand on the side of the machine and run that. So I can move it while it's on, Dave. I'm just going to leave it on for this whole process. It's on. So let's do a small one or two at the top. Because I think starting with a big one, I don't know, just doesn't strike me as super pleasing. So I've got BSR1 on, which on the Bernina is a stitch regulated where the needle just continues to go gently even when I'm not moving it. So that's kind of my go-to um, stitch regulated mode. And I've got my stitch length set at 10. And I'm just going to buzz across like so. So this is a great time to be thinking up questions because it's going to be a little bit like watching paint dry, laying in some of these lines. And I'm just going to pull it toward me about a quarter of an inch and go back the other direction. For those of you who are not Bernina owners, the little red lights that you see are the cameras. And they are the stitch regulators. So they're watching the movement of the fabric from underneath. And that's what is regulating my stitch length.
I haven't done a ton of straight line quilting on my Bernina yet. I just got it in January and somehow those types of quilts have not come up very often in the last couple of months. So I'm not entirely familiar with how fast or slow I can actually go with it. So I'm kind of taking it easy this morning. And on this one for fun, I'm going to actually put three parallel lines. I'm going to try and get them evenly placed. So I'm just going to work my way down the quilting area that is exposed right now and lay in these lines and then we'll come back and do pretty borders in them. So while I do this, let's talk about a couple other things. Um, for one thing, if you're enjoying this kind of uh, live and unscripted sort of real-time quilting, do hit that like button, the thumbs up, and do subscribe to the channel so that you get notified whenever new episodes are coming your way. I try to air these twice a month. They are subject to Mr. Producer being able to be here for the day, both of us being home and not traveling. So we do our best, but we try and air them about twice a month. And each one is different. They are very frequently client quilts and therefore different techniques, sometimes different challenges, etc. I'll add one little tip in here. Can you see that I'm laying my left hand gently on the quilt that has already been stitched on the area of the line that's already stitched? Sometimes when you're quilting really long parallel lines, the fabric wants to push ahead of you just a little bit under the hopper foot. So that tiny bit of pressure on the on the bit that's already been stitched just keeps the fabric feeding under the needle smoothly so if you're finding that when you get to the far edge of your quilt you're having a little rumple just do this to fix it super easy so just a couple more um, a couple more places you can find me if you're interested. I'm on social media, so Instagram and Facebook. I often post photographs there and particularly photographs of some of these projects after they're finished. Sometimes when you're looking at the big project on the YouTube channel, you can't see, you know, the details of the quilting up close or see the contrast. Sometimes they're busy prints, so you really can't see the quilt. So I try and post photographs of that. I also have a podcast, so you can listen to that anywhere that podcasts are found. It's called Measure Twice, Cut Once. And just this week, I started releasing all the past episodes of the podcast also on YouTube. So you can look on my YouTube channel and you'll see something there uh, on, on my front profile page. You'll see playlists and one of them is podcast. So the beauty there is you can listen and also if you want to, the um, transcription is there. So you can also read if you care to. And we added some pretty quilt eye candy too, because why not? Okay, all the lines are in place. I'm gonna go back and start at the right just for cuz. I'm still getting warmed up and it's always a little easier to quilt from right to left. I'm also going to pause for just a second and put a drop of oil in Stella. I'm not sure that you can hear it on camera, but there's just a little rattle going on in the bobbin, which is kind of a typical uh, Bernina signal that you should be oiling your machine. Now I did oil before I started this morning, and I oiled it multiple times yesterday, but I'm getting this little rattle. So I'm gonna go in there and um, just give it a good oil just to be on the safe side. Drop of oil never hurt. So have you got any questions that we can dive into while I do that? I'm just putting in one drop of oil, running my bobbin casing back and forth, just a touch to disperse it a bit. So someone's, someone's, uh, hang on a second here. Do, 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 do. Is there one or two questions that I can talk a little bit and get quilting while I do the talking? Um, 
Okay, someone's asking if I'm going to be at Sisters, Oregon. Tomorrow, there is an outdoor quilt show going on there. And the happy answer is, yes, I am. I've never been before. So this is a first for me. I am meeting my sister-in-law. And we are going to be hanging around like tourists. I have no quilts in the show. I'm not teaching nothing, nothing. Just going there to see what's pretty. So looking forward to that. And Mr. Producer is looking for questions. Lissa, might you travel to the Denver area this or next year? Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any travel uh, locations in Denver, but I don't know my calendar for 2024 yet at all. Speaking of Bernina and traveling for them, I don't know what the calendar is yet. So I don't know. Sorry. Vicki, I know for a while you had thread breakage problems. Were you ever able to figure out the reason? Yes. And I have alluded to this a couple of times, Vicki. I mean, there were a number of small factors. There are always, multi, it seems like, multiple things that contribute. But the number one was I went and had a full servicing done on my machine. I had put about 4 million stitches on it. Um, so it's kind of like having your tires rotated, going and having that check or alignment done. And the one thing that he found was that my needle bar was ever so slightly off center. So that one thing seemed to be the largest contributor. So of course he corrected that and that took care of almost entirely the issue. And I've just been learning more about tension and balancing all of that too. So it seems to be good. It seems to be good. Thank you for your, for asking. Janice, do you check the stitch quality on top and bottom before you start quilting? If so, how often do you do it? Oh gosh, Janice, I'm very irregular about it. Oh, I'm sorry. How do you do it? Not how often. I'm terribly irregular, Janice. Often I will have more extra backing on the side of my quilt and I'll lay a strip of fabric on there on top of that extra batting and backing and just do a little, usually I do straight lines, corners, and loops and bubbles. And those three things will kind of showcase any improper tension that's happening. As it happens today, I was already quilting a lot this morning, so I knew things were running pretty well, and I just checked my bobbin tension before I loaded up and started quilting. But another quick way that you can do it is to take your fingernail underneath the quilting and run it really firmly along a line of quilting. And if you had any laddering or eyelashing happening under there, you feel that with your fingernail. So that's another quick way of checking the tension. Alicia, should I do lock stitches when I start quilting off the top? I've noticed that sometimes my stitches start pulling out on the edges. You know, I tend to. I tend to try and lock those stitches. And I this is one of the reasons I love quilting tops freehand is because I can control when that end is. It never gets sliced off because I've quilted way off the end. So I tend to lock stitch in the edges. Another way to handle it might be to shorten your stitch length and you'll have less problems with stitches coming undone as well. Pam, hope to see you in Sisters tomorrow if you make it. I'm wondering where your belly bar hits your torso so that it causes the least amount of strain and best visibility. Gosh. I mean, mine is is kind of rib cage level and I, it's higher than most people's is. That's my preference because I tend to do a lot of freehand and edge to edge quilting, not a lot of ruler work. So I like it to be up fairly high. That's my personal preference. It feels good for me. Susie, do you have a place that shows the different quilting patterns that you like to do? I do, Susie. I have a Pinterest um, account stitched by Susan. And within my account, there's two boards that are only my quilting. They're like a, a photo gallery. One's called My Gallery Edge to Edge, and one is My Gallery Custom. So those are all pictures of my quilting designs, and you can leaf through them at your leisure. And Anne, what color is your bobbin thread? It is the same as my top thread today. I've got this little, you can see it there coral color. It looks a bit darker on camera, I feel like, than it is in real life. It's a very soft, melony, corally color. Uh, Monica, have you tried this type of whole cloth with different thread colors? Um, a little bit. Monica, I've always kind of made my thread color fairly close to matching the top, but of course I know that it's going to show on that print on the bottom, so I want to be careful what I do for that as well. So I haven't done one with a highly contrasting thread, but that would be a fun experiment, wouldn't it? And again, small quilt like this is the perfect place to try out things. Terry, when doing a border, how do you handle the corners? Do you do top bottom borders and then flip the quilt or do you quilt as you go? I mean, that's not really part of today's project, Terry, but the very short answer is my preference is to start at one point on the border and lap the whole thing and join up where I began. So I advance and rewind my quilt such that I can do that almost always. Robin, I have two quilts at Sisters that I quilted for one of the teachers. They will be in the teacher's show. Her name is Sally Frey. Look them up. I sure will. I sure will, Robin. 
Sally Frey. Mary, I haven't had much success with manual channel locks. Any suggestions? I mean, what manual channel locks do you have? Are they magnetic? Are they belt engagement like mine? Um, probably your best bet is either to reach out to the manufacturer of your machine or reach out. I always give this answer, but it's a good one. Reach out in Facebook groups to people that own a very similar machine. That's usually where you'll get your best answers. Okay, that's it. We got to get started quilting borders, you guys. For fun, we're going to quilt the big one first. So Mr. Producer is telling me that because of the color, the stitching is not super duper showing up. Hmm, my bobbin thread's really tight. What's the scoop? That is not right. I'm gonna pull my bobbin out and have a look again. Um, so sorry about that, but again, remember that I will try and post pictures of this so you can come back to it and have a look at it later. And remember too that these episodes are not they're not a class. They're not an instruction. I'm letting you watch over my shoulder as I work. And the idea is more to give you the big picture of the whole quilt and the process of loading and how I think through it than the actual stitching construction. So that's why we have cameras that uh, show more of me and more of the frame. And um, you can't always see all of the quilting. Anyway, for this large one, I'm going to do a kind of... Um, repeating figure eight all the way across from top to bottom. And I'm just eyeballing my spacing. You certainly could pre-draw it on there if you wanted to. I've got them about two inches apart. For some of these borders, I will turn the manual stitching mode on and then those little red lights won't be on. And I think that will help your visibility too. Actually, this design kind of highlights one of the things that I love about my Bernina is that it, it glides very smoothly on diagonal lines, which not all long arms do. They have very individual preferences, it seems like. Okay, here's where the magic comes in. I'm going to turn it on manual to go back and see how it works. Let me just slow it down. I had it really cranked up this morning. Okay. Watch this magic. I'm going to go back and quilt smaller crazy eights right between. And it's going to make this super cute little border. And now I've got the manual mode turned on so that the little red lights are gone. So now my needle is just moving at a fixed pace and my movement is determining the stitch length. And I'm just trying to make it match the stitching that went before. Well, I didn't really see this coming that this fabric is exactly like camouflage for the stitching. You can hardly see it. But I'll make sure to take some photographs kind of against the light so that it really does show up the stitching and you can get a good look at it. Note to self, a solid color is probably a better choice. So that's that one. Oh, I don't think the roving camera is going to show it either. Okay, Mr. Producer is telling us that we can look at this on the roving camera and you can see it. We won't have the time to do this with every design. I don't have a picture, babe. There, can you guys see it? It doesn't show all that well, does it? <laughs> it's truly like camouflage. I'll get a straight on one so you can kind of see the large and the small. 
figure eights overlapping. Okay. Okay, back to the real thing. So let's see, what else shall we quilt? We're gonna start in this top one. I'm just gonna do some C curls. I know I've said it before, but I'll keep saying it. This is just a fabulous opportunity for you to try out any border design that you've been looking at and not knowing if you have the right quilt to do it on or if you actually even love it stitched out. This is the easiest possible way to try them out because you're only stitching in one direction and it's only a short distance. I guess you could stitch in two directions left to right and right to left, but you don't have to do all four sides necessarily, as you often do on a border, right? And that can be intimidating, thinking of trying to stitch it in all four directions, especially if you stitch actual borders like I do, which is in a lap. You have to be prepared to stitch it in all directions then. But for these little borders, it's the perfect chance to practice because you don't have to do all of that. So this time I'm just doing little O's, kind of larger ones with smaller ones um, resting on the bottom edge of them. And I do like doing these O's because you never have to stop or change direction. You just keep going round and round and round. This is a great way to practice making your round circles. Well, I tell you what, I feel like I should apologize for my fabric choice now. I had no idea that this would be such a great camouflage. But it really, really is, isn't it? So I think here we'll do maybe some simple L and E shapes. So I'll just alternate small loops and large loops. So they're about half height and whole height. Uh, what's probably a two and a half inch border it's a little more than two for sure you're gonna get tired of hearing me say it but again this is just a fantastic way to be actually practicing the control of your machine the rhythmic repetitive quality of your loops you could certainly do them all the same height if you wanted to and I probably will at some point during this whole quilt it's a great way to practice that So for those of you who are not familiar with the difference between regulated stitching and non, let me emphasize that a little bit. I've got non-regulated or sometimes called manual or constant mode on right now, which means I predetermined a speed. So on this machine, it's literally how many stitches per inch. So I predetermined that speed. And when I press start, my needle starts going up and down at that speed. It's completely up to me to determine the stitch length with my movements. What this does is it makes it really important that I move smoothly. So this is a great exercise for learning to move smoothly because otherwise you have great galloping stitches combined with short teeny tiny ones. So it's a great way to focus on your smooth movements. 
and when you have the stitch regulator turned on, that means you set a stitch length, such as 10 stitches per inch. And in my case, the little camera, in your case, it might be encoders, um, are watching the movement of your fabric and trying to speed up and slow down the motor to keep that stitch length consistent. That can also be a good way to practice your smoothness because you can hear in the motor the speed of it. Okay, I gotta go look at my quilt and see what else I wanna put in next. Um, let's see, I think we're gonna do a really simple one, although this is a bigger line. I think I'll do ribbon candy in the next one, but I'm actually gonna cheat and I'm gonna go start on the left-hand side. Ribbon candy is, I absolutely love it, but I feel like I have to be warmed up to be able to do it in any direction. And I'm not there yet this morning. Maybe a little later on the quilt. So someone is suggesting a side light for the purposes of being able to see the quilt. We'll give it a try. I do have a lamp here, but because we have overhead lights on, I don't think that's going to be super effective. But we'll give it a try. And again, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that such a little bit of mottling would work as such good camouflage. So here again, I have pulled up my bobbin thread for the one of you that asked that and done a few lock stitches at the edge. And I do like to do that, yes. Let me turn up my speed just a touchy touch. So I'm at 1,350 stitches per inch right now. If your machine measures in that way, that might mean something to you. Otherwise it may not, but let's lay down some ribbon candy. always interesting to me how ribbon candy I mean I often say that quilting is like handwriting but ribbon candy especially each person's is so unique the amount of curvature they have in it or not it's kind of fascinating how each person's quilting is so individual I don't know if you're like me, but when I'm scrolling through my Instagram feed, for example, some of the quilters that I follow, I can recognize their quilting. I'll see a picture and I'll know before I see their name who that is. And that's why there's something very individual about their style of quilting and their motions. Okay, we are at the last one. I'm back on BSR1, so I've got my stitch regulator back on. And I'm going to do a really simple one. This last border is about an inch and a quarter wide. And I'm just going to do a simple wavy line between the two edges of it. And I'm going to pause with my needle down. And we're going to advance the quilt. So I believe I mentioned at the beginning, but I'll say again, if you're wanting to do a project like this for yourself, it's very simple. I went and bought a yard and a half of backing fabric and a yard and a quarter of top fabric. I find that makes a pretty nice proportion and it gives you enough extra backing that you've got um, room to work with on the sides. And I forgot actually about my whole red snapper system. I need to move my machine off to the edge so I'm not leaving the needle down. I am taking it off. I just need to move right beside it. There we go. So many things. All right, 
right, so I've advanced my little quilt. Again, this is something that I always do when I'm getting into my new advance is I reach on this front rail and I tug both on the fabric and the batting. Can you see that? I have both of them. This is a small quilt, so you won't see it as much, but in a larger quilt, somehow the batting wants to pull in toward the center and pull up. So I always give that batting a nice little tug. If I'm not confident that I'm getting it smooth, the beauty of a floating top is you can literally lift it right up and see that batting and see if it needs any adjustment. And then smooth your quilt back over top of it. Then I'm going to base the left and the right side again, and then I will take a few questions. So I'm just starting overlapping my last basting line a little bit. And then basting down each edge. And again, I do not have my channel lock on. I'm using the selvage edge of my backing as a guideline. It is perfectly straight. I know that, right? Because it's a selvage edge. So as long as I line up my fabric with that, it just saves one step of measuring or marking or turning, engaging the belts. I have to learn to say that correctly. Engaging the belts, engaging the belts. <laughs> on my last machine on my gamble. They were channel locks, they were magnetic locks. And so I got so used to saying that phrase. So again, this just secures all the areas of the quilt. And I get asked very frequently why I do my clamping after I have basted. And here's why. I feel like if I clamp first, I am putting tension on that backing already and not on the top, and then I base them together and I clamp, and that backing I think has more tension then. So I prefer to let all the fabrics and the batting relax, base them together, and then clamp all the layers and put that gentle tension on all the layers. And this side of the quilt has almost a quarter inch of little fringe on that edge. Let me move Stella a little bit more, see if I can get that into my head snapper. Almost. We got it. So a little gentle tension on the side. Trusty yard stick to lift it up a little bit. Same thing on the left. I wish I'd had this fabric when I was making my little instructional video. You can't always find the tricky fabrics when you want to. So I do hear from a lot of you that these red snappers, the side clamps, sometimes give you grief in terms of getting the fabric into them. So I'm trying to show you the tips as I come across them. The sturdy pin is a really good one. Okay, let's move Stella, get coffee in hand, and we will talk over some questions. And by the way, this is a pretty small project. There are only going to be three passes, so fairly straightforward. Okay, I'm ready. Whew, coffee in hand. Okay, Susan, when you float your quilt, is the quilt top and batting on the floor at your feet? Does that get in the way? Yes, it's on the floor at my feet. And no, it doesn't really get in the way. When I have a bigger quilt, I kind of, with my feet, I, I push it in under. If it's a huge quilt, I literally, at the other side, kind of pull them through because I don't really want it to get wrinkled and so forth. So, I mean, it does mean that you've got to keep your floor pretty clean and I vacuum frequently because I don't want batting scraps and, and stuff, right? Getting caught on it. So you do have to keep a clean floor, but I do let it hang on the floor, yeah. Jan, when you stitch around all four borders, do you start with that stitching or do you do the middle of the quilt first? So you're referring, Jan, to my process of lapping a border around a quilt. It is not the first thing. Excuse me, that's usually on a custom quilt then and there will be various reasons why you'll do things in different orders. But generally, I will have at least uh, stitched in the ditch around some of the borders and often will have quilted some areas of the quilt and frequently I will leave those borders to last. So their ditches are stitched, they're stabilized, but I'll actually do that lap late on in the quilting process. Ma Mamondi, why do you leave your ruler foot on when not using rulers? I have a difficult time seeing exactly where my needle is. Any suggestions? If you're having difficulty, by all means, change back to the other, other feet that have more visibility. I just do it for the sake of ease. Um, that's all. 
There's no particular reason. Marilyn, wondering if you can see the quilting better than us. A little better than you, although I'll be honest, it is not an easy one. And I did not see that coming, that this would be so difficult to see. And I apologize for that. I could have done a solid equally well. I thought this would be more interesting. Monica, do you plan to make reference to the backing theme and add something pictorial like panther paws? Oh, I had not thought of that at all, Monica, honestly. I had not thought of that. So at this point, no. But that's a great idea. Carol, is that the speed per inch or minute? So stitches per inch is when you have stitch regulation on. So it's not a speed, it's a number of stitches per inch that your machine is trying to achieve. And when I said to you uh, the speed for manual, that was stitches per minute. So the 1300 or whatever I had it at, that is stitches per minute, yes. Jan, is the ribbon candy? Oh, it was hard to see, but with all the lesson part that you talk about, so rewarding. So uh, Jan is referring to my freehand quilting masterclass, which she's been a student in. So this is um, a full-fledged online course that I have. It, it's offered on demand, so you can watch it at your own leisure. You have access to it forever. And one of the designs that I teach in it is ribbon candy. Heavy emphasis in that class, not so much on borders like this, but on edge-to-edge -edge quilting on what I call couch quilts. So there's over 30 designs in that master class, and I walk you through step-by-step -step how I do them and some of my best tips for forming them. And just and I do it on black fabric with white thread so you can really, really see what it's all about. So if you're interested in more information about that master class, you can head to my website, stitchedbysusan.com, and there's information there on that. The next session will be coming up this fall. Teresa. Not really a question, but a huge thank you, Susan. I quilted a quilt and couldn't see my stitches and used the lamp and turned my lights off and it truly was a saver. Um, so what Teresa is referring to, I'm gonna set down my mug so I can gesture with my arms. I can't talk without my arms. The lamp that we've got set at the side today is, is a very small one, but when I do have a quilt that for my purposes is really, really difficult to see, I turn off all the lights, machine lights, room lights, all the lights I turn off, and I have some type of light shining from the side. In my case, it's just a simple floor lamp that shines on it from the side and basically quilt by shadow because you can then see the, the, the press down where your stitching is. So when I have the very most difficult fabrics, that's what I go to. Okay, more questions? Yep. Catherine, is there a reason to base top to bottom compared to bottom to top? Well, I think the rationale for some quilters is in order to know that you're getting all the fabric into that that you need to, you start at the bottom and you work to the top and then you ease in any excess that you need to. I'm doing the same process in a different way. I know how much fabric I need to get there and either I drop a pin in or I just place the fabric where I need it to be and I just do it by being conscious of it, pulling it under the needle faster if I need to. Whatever I need to, to not be pressing that fabric away from me and having excess at the bottom edge. It's just a preference though, really. Jeannie, what is the red holder on your wall that has the rulers? I see what you mean and I know what you mean. It, it is a holder that a friend gave me. So it's got some pockets in the front and has all my rulers and it's got a little bar on the bottom, which you can kind of see and I've just got S hooks on it with my lint holders on it. I don't know what brand it is or where it came from. It has no name on it, I'm sorry, but it's very cute. Donna, I noticed your Stella stays where you put her. I have a gamma like your Lucy. Can you give some tips on how to level? I mean, honestly, we leveled. My husband has a four foot level that we use, but honestly, you can do it just with your machine. If your machine is rolling toward the right, you've got to raise the right end of your machine. Likewise, if, you know, if it's rolling left or front or back, that will tell you what you need to do to shift it. But it's important that it be level front to back and level side to side. That's what affects having your machine able to sit still when you let go of it. That means it's level. And that can make a difference in your stitching. Okay, apparently there's two alike in a row. Let's see. Jan, wait, what, are you going to have a new class in the fall? I sure hope I ho heard you because I'm there. And uh, Jan, do you have any particular tips for quilting ribbon candy well and uniformly? Okay, both related to the class. I mean, I do have tips for ribbon candy, Jan, and honestly, most of them are in are in that class. And it's better because like I said it's black fabric and white thread and you can really see what I'm doing and these live and unscripted episodes are much more about the whole picture than about how to quilt the individual thing 
Um, and Jan, it's not a new class coming out. It's just another, I, I run that class. I invite a group of students into that class about twice a year. So the next session is coming up in the fall. Pam, sounds like you are able to roll the quilt back and forth when the quilt is floated. Can you roll back and forth when it's loaded using the Bernina method? Yes, because if your top, even if your top is attached to the rollers, you can still roll it back and forth. Lots of things come into play as to how you've got it basted or stabilized. Like I can't roll this whole floating portion. I can't roll right to the bottom and just quilt a little something and then roll back. I have to consider how I'm going to stabilize those areas, basting lines, etc. That usually comes into play with custom quilting. So there's lots to consider, but absolutely, yes, you can do it. Jackie, does Stella have a black light? Stella does not have a black light. And I, my gamel did, and I never found it useful. That might be just me and the type of quilting that I was doing, but like for busy prints or colors that were blending and I couldn't see the stitching, the black light was never the ticket for me. The side light was always the ticket. So it was not high on my list of priorities at all in a new machine. I never used my black light. Okay, that's it for questions. Folks, we got to get quilting. So let's lay down some new lines. Again, I'm kind of randomizing them, but I know I want to put three or four of the, the larger six inch chunky ones in. So let's do another one of those now. Okay, and I'm engaging my belt here. The Bernina has a little feature. I won't go into the, the great depths of it, but it has a little feature whereby I can have that belt engaged and I am still able to move it. And that's what I'm going to use here. So that's how you're seeing me quilt these lines one right after another without ever actually disengaging that belt. Are you able to hear that, Mr. Producer, sir? Are you able to hear that? Hang on a sec, you guys, I'm pausing. So you guys, I think I'm gonna make an executive decision here actually, which is going to be an end to this quilt. I am hearing a noise in my machine that I don't like the sound of. It's not the bobbin. It is something in the the needle portion of it. And it sounds like it sounds like metal that has not been oiled, which I don't have to oil this machine, so I'm not really sure what that is. But I know that I want to not proceed without checking out what it is. So Let's get me on the main camera. Let's take a few more questions. And I know this is an awkward and rather abrupt end to the episode, but I also realize you're not getting a chance to really see the stitching either. So let's talk about it a few more minutes and then I'll proceed with the quilting and I'll try and get to the bottom of this terrible noise. <laughs> and we'll go from there. Uh, front camera's fine. There we are. So yeah, let me just grab my coffee while we talk. I'm sorry that's an abrupt end, and I know I've done this a couple times before, but if there's one thing I have learned in my long arm journey, it's when something isn't right, just stop and address it. Don't keep going. And so I don't know that this is something that I can address on air, but I promise I will either post about it or talk about it in my next episode when I figure out what it is. I just, it sounds like metal on metal a little bit, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to push through that with my machine. I'm going to get to the bottom of what that is. So. Let's take a couple questions if indeed there are some. Jen, I heard you say belt. Is that the cumatic system you added on now and how do you like it? Yes, the belt is the cumatic system. So there's an X and a Y axis, right? And that's what drives the machine when I've got the cumatic system engaged. Um, I do like it. I actually posted some pictures earlier this morning of a quilt that I just finished, a huge quilt, 112 inches long, and I did that all on the cumatic. So I'm still learning. That to me is, is um, very new ground and there's lots of tricks and shortcuts and knowledge to be learned there. So I'm still very much a beginner at using the schematic system, but I'm quite enjoying it. It works very smoothly. Two part question. Jan, what do you mean you don't have to oil Stella? Okay, second part. 
Just an FYI that you have to oil the Q24 every day. Okay, got you on both. So Jan, to answer your questions first, I don't have to oil the motor part of Stella. I do have to oil Stella. And Jen, yes, you have to oil the Q24 every day. I've already oiled it twice today. But I know the sound of the bobbin, which is the bobbin casing is where I put a drop of oil every day. I know that sound when it's needing oil, and it is not that sound. It is definitely something up in the higher motor head. So that's why I'm going to take it seriously and address it. Okay, that's it for questions. Well, let's do a quick close up then. Again, I'm sorry that this is, you know, such an abrupt ending. But again, the quilting is just not showing up super well on this lovely camouflage fabric anyway. So next time I will, next time I do a whole cloth, I will stick with an absolute solid so that you guys can hopefully at least see the quilting. And maybe I'll repeat this one, honestly, with these borders, because it's a great idea and it is such a fun way to practice different border ideas in different scales and sizes and, you know, small scale, not too much of it all just on a straight line. It's an easy way to practice those designs. So I'll probably plan another one of these in the not too distant future. Meantime, I will finish this one. It'll make a great baby gift for some sweet baby. And I will post photographs so that you can see what quilting I did choose to do. So in, in um, summary, I used a Tula Pink um, Free Spirit fabric on the back. Uh, do you wanna show one image that shows that a little bit? You can kind of see it. It's this lovely rainbow um, kind of ombre print. One color goes into another and it's got all the, the leopard and the cheetah and those sorts of animals on it. And then on the front, I have this fabric also by Free Spirit. This is kind of mod modeled coral. Can't, can't see it. Can't really see it. Mr. Producer's bringing me the roving camera, but I just don't think there's enough of it for you to see. But I will post pictures, I, I always do. So give me a couple days because for one thing, I'm going to the Oregon Quilt Show tomorrow. And for another, I kind of have to wait for morning light to get some good um, photographs of these quilts. So uh, let's see. What do we want to chat about before we go? If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe. That lets you be notified when future um, episodes are coming. We try to air these live and unscripted episodes about twice a month. So they are always real time warts and all. So when smaller things happen like thread breakage, you know, needle breakage, etc., that's just part of the show and I talk through the process as I do it. I'm calling a halt today because I don't know that I can find an answer in a few minutes on my machine. I'm probably going to have to make some phone calls. So it just but this is an important lesson though too. When something's not sounding right, stop and address it. So whether it's just a simple tension issue or whether it's a dull needle, or whether it's, you know, bobbin casing that needs oiling, I've learned to be attuned to those cues and you can too. Learn to know your machine and its sounds. And when it's not quite right, stop and address it. So that's what I'm doing today. Um, anything else we wanted to say, Mr. Producer? Okay, let's take those couple more questions. Yeah. Mary, do you have a favorite design for sashing, sort of like borders? Um, is sashing of borders, yes. Oh gosh, do I have a favorite? Ribbon candy is right up there. I do love ribbon candy. It catches the light and it's just so fun and so charming. So I think that's my favorite. Sue, any chance you'll be at the quilt show in Madison, Wisconsin in September, weekend after Labor Day? Not to my knowledge. I don't have any plans to be there, at least not this year. Like I said, I don't know my 2024 schedule for Bernina yet, so. Okay, that's it for questions. All right, so a couple more things as we go. Remember, if you do care to support the show, we're in the process of doing massive upgrading in our lights and more camera. So you can do that if you wish to at buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. Every dollar that comes in there does go straight into up-leveling our equipment. So hopefully over the next few weeks you'll be seeing, or months, you'll be seeing some real improvements there. So, and you can always find me on the podcast as well, podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. You can listen on any platform that you choose, or it is also available on this on the YouTube channel now as well. Just look for podcasts under my profile and you'll find them there. They're gradually being uploaded. They're not all there yet. So thank you so much for watching. It's been a pleasure quilting with you today. Again, I'm sorry that it's stopping so abruptly, but needs must. And whatever you are sewing or quilting or crafting on today, I hope that you find great pleasure in it. And I will see you next time.